Hey everybody, my name is Brendan Carr. I serve in the United States Navy as an aerospace physiologist. And people ask me, what the heck is an aerospace physiologist? So in this video, I'm going to give an in-depth explanation of what it is that an aerospace physiologist does in the Navy. Here we go. So whenever people talk to me about what I do for work, the question always comes up, what does that mean? What is an aerospace physiologist? It's not, it's not an everyday job. Like some people in the military have relatively normal jobs. They're cooks, lawyers, doctors, but aerospace physiologists, it sounds complex and there's a lot that goes into it. So I think the best way to explain it is to explain the path that my career has followed and what I've done in each of those steps. And that'll give you a sense of what an aerospace physiologist does because it varies from stage to stage in a career. In one of my previous videos, I explained how I became an aerospace physiologist. So if you're someone who's maybe a graduate student who's looking to become a physiologist now that you've finished some graduate training, or maybe someone who's in the Navy and looking to transition into being an aerospace physiologist, you can check out that previous video and I'll put that down in the description. So after the process of becoming an aerospace physiologist in the sense of being recruited by the Navy, signing the paperwork, commissioning, all of that, then I went to officer training in Newport, Rhode Island, or ODS, Officer Development School. So because of the nature of being a physiologist or someone who's in a staff role, like a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse, a dentist, we come in with a commission, but we still have to go through some sort of training. Normally other people in other roles, they go through a, a training process. They get selected through that process to then commission and become officers. But in the case of someone in a staff role like me, we're commissioned and then we go to officer training. So this is where we learn to wear the uniform, shine shoes, learn military customs, basics of how to name ships, uh, basics of military life, getting used to being around people and all the stuff, getting up in the morning, doing lots of push-ups, yelling, all of those things go into that initial officer development school. And also a lot of theory on leadership, although there isn't much hands-on, you don't have people working for you necessarily, but you're getting some of that training in that officer development school. After that, it gets more specific than just being a naval officer. Then we get into the nitty gritty of what an aerospace physiologist does. And an aerospace physiologist is going to perform a number of roles in the Navy, but a few things to be prepared for to teach survival and to teach performance, mostly to aviators, but also to some other groups, special operators, even ground forces at times with Marines, they'll still need to learn some survival skills that are relevant to the aviators. So to be exceptional in these fields, to be someone who is ready to teach people and to give to them, there are a few things that go into that. One is your initial qualifications, but then second is having actual training from the Navy in these fields to make you better. This process of becoming someone who's ready to teach people in the Navy starts in Pensacola, Florida. So after the officer development school, you go to Pensacola, Florida, and there are three things that are gonna happen there. You're gonna go through a lot of classroom work there where you're gonna learn about the Navy style of physiology, what they want you to know, what is important, what is the curriculum that you're going to teach to people in the Navy and how to teach that. You're gonna get instruction as an instructor. They're gonna help you to be better. You'll be critiqued on your instructing. You'll practice the briefs that you'll go on to give throughout your career. A lot of the fundamentals of aerospace physiology. So there's topics like hypoxia and hyperventilation or what we'd say altitude threats, the things that happen to your body at altitude. Human performance in general, an overview of everything, diet, exercise, sleep, nutrition, all those basics, so many of the things that I talk about on this channel. There's gonna be a section on sensory illusions and spatial disorientation or sensory physiology. So all about the things, the psychology of perception, the psychology of flying a plane, or if you're a parachutist, the psychology of perceiving the world as you're moving at speeds while you are dropping from the sky. And also the physiology of acceleration, the physiology of pulling G's in an aircraft. So if you're in a fighter jet, you know how to pull seven and a half G's and what that's gonna to do to your body and how you're gonna experience that and tense your muscles through that and the breathing techniques. And you're gonna be prepared not only to do this yourself, but to teach it to others. That's a lot of what's happening in this first phase, learning the science and learning to teach it to others. While you're still in Pensacola, there are a couple of other things to do. Next, there's a phase where you're going to go through a ground school for aviation. You're gonna learn what goes on in a plane, things like weather, navigation, and aerodynamics, these fundamental ground school topics. You learn all that, and then you go through the survival training curriculum that you'll actually eventually be a teacher of. So you're gonna see it, what it's like to be a student, go through that, get qualified to fly, 
do the basic survival stuff so they know you could handle an ejection, they know that you could handle a crash, they know that you would know how to use supplementary oxygen or a parachute if you needed to, all of that. And then you go to the third phase of things, which is the actual flying, and go through an abbreviated syllabus, not a full-on student syllabus, something that would get you to the point where you could totally fly plane on your own, but to the point where you're comfortable flying fixed wing and rotary wing. That means helicopters or helos, as we say in the Navy. So all of this is happening in Pensacola. There's the student side of it where you're learning the science and learning to be a teacher. There's the ground school portion and there's the flying portion. All of that happens in Pensacola. If you successfully complete all of that, then you get your wings as an aerospace physiologist. Then when you get your wings, you go on to be a full-time instructor and a leader in a training unit. So you go to an aviation survival training center, an ASTC, somewhere in the US. There are eight all across the US. You could be at any one of them and you go there to be an instructor and day in, day out, you are teaching those briefs that we talked about. The acceleration physiology, the sensory physiology, the human performance and the altitude threats. You're teaching those again and again while at the same time you are leading people around you, you have a team of people who are working at this training center, moving people through the training center, and you are a leader to them, probably second in command at your unit. There's probably gonna be someone who's more senior, and then you're gonna be the junior officer, and then there'll be a bunch of enlisted people and civilians who will work with you as well. At the same time that you're teaching and training and leading people in this unit, there's also still flying to be done. You're gonna go out and fly at least four hours a month in whatever kind of aircraft are around. If you're stationed in a place like Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia, where I was, then you can be flying in anything because the whole fleet is run out of Norfolk. So there's big wing aircraft, there are helicopters, there are fighter jets, there's things all over, and you get to fly in any of those as long as they will take you, but you're qualified to get in them as long as they have the time and the space to put you in the aircraft. So you're doing that at least four hours a month, getting your flying time in, and you're working on knocking off a whole bunch of qualifications, a whole list of things that show that you are developing as a naval officer. So you're learning this program, that program, you're talking to your boss and your boss is checking you off so that they know that you're progressing, they know that you're becoming a more rounded naval officer. And when you complete that whole checklist and then a final verbal board, a big verbal test, a murder board, then you are considered complete with that phase, a preceptorship or an internship, depending on what you wanna call it, but you're complete with that phase after you've been signed off on all these things and completed the murder board. After all that, you go on to an AMSO tour. AMSO means Aeromedical Safety Officer or AMSO. You can see on my name tag, that's my job title right now. I'm an Aeromedical Safety Officer and you usually work at something like a Navy Wing or Marine Corps MAG or Marine Corps MA. One of these headquarters elements that oversees many people flying a diverse set of aircraft. In my case, I oversee E2s, C2s, and Navy V22s all around the world because I work at this wing, at Com ACC Log Wing. That's where I work, and that's what I represent in my work. So to work as an AMSO, you're still a physiologist. That's what you are. That's your designator, just like a pilot is always a pilot, but they move to different jobs within the Navy. Same thing with a physiologist. I'm always a physiologist, but in this stage of my career, I'm an aeromedical safety officer. And that means instead of just working at a training center and doing steady briefs, instead I'm working at a wing. I have a boss who's a Commodore, that's a Navy captain, an 06, a very senior person, and I'm essentially a consultant to him. I'm there to help him with any issues, any questions that he has about physiology, and at the same time to serve all of those people who fly all those different aircraft under his control. So he's watching out for all these people, these people all fall under him, and because I work for him, I work for those people. I'm there to take care of them, to train them if they've got questions, if they wanna call me up, if they're looking to figure out something about new gear, something about a specific training that they might want from me. All of those things can come up and I'm ready to handle them, especially under those big issues that are my bread and butter, the altitude threats, the sensory physiology, the acceleration physiology, and the human performance. Anything along those lines, that's fair game. Other things come up too. For a lot of AMSOs, there's a lot of issues with night vision goggles or lasers even. In my case, I do a lot with hearing protection, not something I was particularly trained in before the Navy or even in the Navy really, but something that because there has been a need, I've learned to fill it because I'm the physiology guy and hearing is considered a physiology issue. So that's something that I go right for and I try to figure out and I try to serve the people and the Commodore the best that I can in that topic. After an AMSO tour, most people tend to go on and do another AMSO tour, but there's a number of things that you can do 
after that. That's when you really hit all the basics. When you've done the initial training, you've done the flight school, you've done the ASTC tour, that's the training center where you're teaching all the time, you've done an AMSO tour, then it gets pretty spread after that initial pipeline. You can do things, you can go back to the training center and you can be the most senior person there, you can be a director of a training center, you can get into things with acquisitions, you can get into things with bigger organizations. A few people even get into research and development. There's a diverse set of things you can do, but I generally break it into three major categories. There's that training and education piece, like what I talked about being back at the Aviation Survival Training Center. You can do something along those lines. Maybe instead of working at one of those training centers, you work at the headquarters element for that in Pensacola. There's the operational stuff. That's the things like what I do as an aeromedical safety officer, the things where you're with fleet aviators, you're with people who are out doing the mission all the time. And then there's a third branch. It's kind of a cats and dogs. It's gonna be acquisitions, research, behind the scenes kind of things. That's a little bit smaller, a little less common, a little bit out of the norm, but all three of them are important to have a well-rounded career in the world of aerospace physiology. People often ask me if an aerospace physiologist deploys, goes out on ships, things like that. It's very rare. I know only a few who have done that, mostly ones who get attached with marine units. Some of us will go out to a ship briefly to provide some training, help with consulting on something, Maybe there's a mishap and they want a physiologist to be there to take a look at how the survival gear functioned or to, to discuss an issue with the sensory perception of the pilots and what they may have been experiencing or something else with how the air crew might have handled the situation when they're trying to get out of the plane, things like that. We, we can go out for those moments, but most of us stay stateside. Most of us do not deploy. It's very unusual for that to happen. If you have any other questions about being an aerospace physiologist, be sure to let me know. Put that down in the comments. I'll do my best to answer. If I don't have the answer, I can find someone who does, and I'll catch you next time.